And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service, service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first, but I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation, unless they repent of, their, of her works. And I will strike her children dead, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan, to you I say, <clears throat> I do not lay on you any other burden, only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. As when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even I, <clears throat> even as I myself have received authority from my Father, and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The word of the Lord. Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you because you are righteous God, maker of heaven and earth. And I pray that we would stand in awe of your majesty, your greatness. You are other than creation. You are high and lifted up, but you are a God who is near. You are a God who whispers in your word every story, every text, despite the sinfulness that is represented in the hearts of man, I love you. And you have declared it most brilliantly at the cross because you so love the world that you gave your only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish. And Father, this morning we cling to that promise. And we cling to the promise that says, when I go away, I will give you a comforter, the Holy Spirit who guides us in truth and brings to remembrance what you have taught us. Father, may your spirit give uh, the congregation ears to hear and eyes to see and hearts that yearn for your glory and for your word, that they may be changed and go forth from here to tell our friends and our neighbors and make disciples because of Christ who we find our satisfaction in. In his name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. If you're not already there, turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. We look uh, this morning at the letter to the church of Thyatira. And I ask you, I, I can remember in, in high school asking the question, how far is too far? What am I allowed to do as a Christian? How close can I inch to that line? What am I allowed to do? And I remember my youth pastor said, get away from the line. Flee from that line. Don't go near it. But unfortunately, we are people that say there's the line and we get ever so close to it. Because I want to be just like the world that's on the other side of that line. But at the same time, I want God to be happy with me. I want to, you know, make sure that I don't go to hell and find judgment. I think if any of you can resonate with that, if you were little pagans in high school like I was, um, maybe you haven't grown out of your pagancy, if that's a word. Um, we want to inch close as we possibly can. I believe that the believers in Thyatira had that same problem. They wanted to know how much could they look like the world. And so as this letter is being circulated to the churches, it comes, this messenger brings this letter to the fourth church, to Thyatira. And the little assembly comes in together and begins to read, and they hear the letter to Ephesus and to uh, Smyrna and to Pergamum, and now oh, it's their turn. They're a letter that Jesus addresses to them. 
And like all the other letters, Jesus brings a vision of himself. Notice in verse 18, to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the words of the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Now, previously, God has revealed himself, or Christ has revealed himself in different ways. Jesus is not a static, familiar, predictable character that sometimes we see in very shallow writing where we always know the good guy rides on his, on his horse and saves the damsel in distress, and there's not much uh, dynamic attributes of that. But we see with Jesus, as he comes to the different churches, it's not the same Jesus. What is the same Jesus? But he reveals a different aspect of his character to each church according to their needs. Now, to the church at Ephesus, who they took great pride in their privilege and their status in the first century, he came and said, I am the one who holds the seven stars in my hands. He was great and he was glorious and their privilege paled into comparison to his greatness. Then he comes to Smyrna and Smyrna, it was a church that was suffering and they were watching their loved ones die and be in poverty and slandered. And Jesus says, I am the first and the last, the eternal one. I am the one who died just as some of them were dying. But he also says, I am the one who rose again. It was great inspiration and hope given to these people. And then last week we see Pergamum. Pergamum, they were a church that was in battle and they were wavering. They were fighting against this riptide that wanted to bring them out into the sea of relativity and compromise. And he said, I am the king, the judge, and I hold a two-edged sword. And I split between the righteous and the unrighteous, the faithful and the unfaithful, the, the true and the genuine, and then and I divide between the imposters. And we see now Christ turns his attention to Thyatira. Now, we know about Thyatira, it was a bustling city of commerce on the, on the northwest side of Asia Minor. And they were known for their trade and even in scripture, We have Lydia, uh, one of Paul's first converts in Europe. It says, one we heard was a woman named Lydia. Not our Lydia, but from the city of Thyatira. She was a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. And it says, by the grace of God, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Thyatira was a bustling marketplace with successful businesses. And like most businesses that business owners who were trying to break through and make make money and get a profitable company, they said, whatever means necessary, we're going to do. And now Thyatira was on the edge in the church. What they would do is they would have trade guilds and they would have great lavish parties. And at this trade guild, they would worship a patron deity of the Romans and they would offer sacrifices to these idols. And often this reverently would... would, um, denigrate itself into to, to physical immorality, if you get my drift. And the church now was struggling because Thyatira's God was materialism. And they were doing, these Christians were doing anything they could do to preserve themselves. So Jesus comes and he comes as he declares the Son of God in power, in wisdom, in, 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 in justice. And he announces the words that we see, the words of the Son of God in verse 18. And immediately, as Jewish believers living here, they would have been swept over into Psalm chapter 2 that we read for our call to worship. And they would have immediately remembered this messianic psalm of David declaring the greatness of his son and this promise that the kingdom of David would reign. And he said to them, you are my son. And Jesus comes to this church and says, I am the son of God. That son David promised. I have begotten, ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them into pieces like a potter's vessel. 
Jesus presents himself to this church who is flirting with immorality with this kingdom of the world, about to commit spiritual adultery, and he says, I am the Son of God, and the nations and the possessions of the nations belong to me for eternity. And as they are deciding whether or not to consummate their spiritual sin, they see this vision of Jesus, a king who is, has perfect discernment and relentless authority. His eyes are red with flames because he can penetrate the veneer of their holiness and their outward appearances they put on to be able to deceive the people around them. He cannot be fooled. He can see through their best acts. Jesus, and it says his feet are burnished bronze, a strong foundation that cannot be moved, unquestionable authority that he will crush his enemies under his feet by the power of his might. That God comes to them now. He comes to them as a king who has power and wisdom and authority. He searches their heart and he knows truth from error. There is nowhere that they can run that is not in his gaze and where his sovereign feet cannot go. So the question becomes for Thyatira, would they be a church that was distinct from the kingdom of this world, the kingdom of Satan, or a church that stands distinct from the world? Likewise, as we read over the shoulders of Thyatira this morning, the question becomes, will we be a people who sees the authority and wisdom of God and submits in both thought and action, mind and body, to the lordship of Jesus Christ, who is our sovereign king? How will you answer that this morning, Ocean Park? Jesus comes to them in wisdom and power as a reigning king, but he brings encouragement to them. Notice in verse 19, I know your works, your love and your faith, your service and your patient endurance, that the latter works exceed the first. Now, if you remember, for those of you who are here, Ephesus was a church that had really good doctrine and really good theology, but they were lousy on loving one another. Now, Thyatira was a, the flip problem. They loved each other well. Their hearts loved the Lord in love and faith for Christ and his church. They trusted in their promises and their hearts swole with love for Christ and it overflowed with faith. I know your love and your faith. And then also it says your service and your patient endurance. They were devoted not only to Christ, but they were devoted to the church and to one another. They knew the truth of the gospel, had taken root in their life, and because of what Christ had done for them, they were able to do that for others. The church knew that they were loved and they were forgiven. And because they were loved and they were forgiven, they could love and forgive their brothers and sisters in return. And by doing so, the church knew those people, those Jesus followers, they were a strong witness to the love of Christ. They wept with one another. And they rejoiced with one another. They bared each other's burdens. But yet the health of their body, there was a something sinister that was lurking in that church body. There was a cancer that was beginning to infest them and all was not well, though they thought it was. Notice this condemnation that God, Jesus brings to them now in verse 20. I have this against you. Thy retire was a healthy body that abounded in love and they were steadfast in their faith. They were quick to service. They were slow to take offense. Yet this cancer was about to destroy the whole body. Notice what it says. I have this against you that you tolerate that woman, Jezebel. The church was strong in love, but they were weak in discernment. The cancer of false teaching was in them and it was destroying them from the inside, though they had no idea when you would look at them from the outside, you would say, wow, that's a really nice, friendly, kind and loving church. But inside they were dying and it was something that this cancer of false teaching was going to destroy them. And that cancer's name was Jezebel. 
And when we hear the word Jezebel, Jezebel was one of the most notorious, ruthless, wicked women in the Old Testament. She was the foreign wife of Ahab, and she, the, who was one of the evil kings of the northern tribes. Notice this, what they say about Ahab and Jezebel. There was none, speaking of Ahab, who sold himself to that was evil in the sight of the Lord like Ahab. He was a wicked, wicked king. And notice in yellow it says, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. Men, you know your wife has a great, profound influence on you. Single men, choose wisely. Marry over your head because your wife will have a profound impact on you. He acted very abominably in going after gods, idols, as the Amorites had done when the Lord cast out before the people of Israel. Jezebel was a wicked woman. She was a champion for idolatry. In fact, it says in the great uh, clash between Elijah and Jezebel, she had sponsored herself 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Ashtoreth. All the while, as she's funding these people, she's slaughtering the good prophets of the one true God. So much so, this woman's angst and rage that Elijah, the great prophet of the Old Testament, cowered in fear and hid himself because of the wrath of Jezebel. When you call somebody Jezebel, at least in Scripture, you're not paying them a compliment. I had a comedian, John Christ, who write, writes comedy about, um, you know, church people. He's a Christian himself. And he says, you know, you can tell when somebody doesn't know the Bible real well when they introduce their kid. This is Cain, and this is Goliath, and this is Jezebel. <laughs> Clearly, they haven't read those stories. So we, in Thyatira, there was a Jezebel. Her name probably wasn't Jezebel. But I can imagine the hands of the scribe and, who, and the messenger as he was reading this, and he says, and you tolerate Jezebel. And there was probably a great hush, a gasp. And I would imagine all of the congregation looked at this woman and her rage and her scorn and her sneer to that messenger was devastating. Notice this Thyatiran Jezebel called herself a prophetess. She had a self proclaimed authority. Verse 20, a prophet ultimately is a mouthpiece of God. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, men and women have been chosen by God to declare the message of God. We think of people like Moses and Elijah, Elisha, Isaiah, Jeremiah. In the New Testament, people like Anna, when Jesus was brought to the temple, Agabus in the book of Acts, and many others were called prophets and prophetesses. But Jezebel herself declared herself as a prophetess. And she began teaching a new doctrine that was seducing this church and bringing them away from the one true God with a new way of thinking. Notice in verse 24, it says that she is teaching, it says, the deep things of Satan. This self-appointed prophet was probably coming and saying, I am teaching something that nobody has ever seen before. I have this great enlightenment. And people were like, oh, really? You're a prophet? And they were eating this stuff up to the detriment of their soul. It's very much like Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 4, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, the truth of the gospel, but will have itching ears. Oh, they want something new. Let's get the Bible code. Let's get all this stuff. They will accumulate for themselves teachers, or we could be faithful to say prophets or prophetesses, to suit their own passions. And they will turn away from listening to the truth and wandering off into myths. Paul warns Timothy that you have to combat this stuff. And Jezebel was giving people what they wanted, and they were eating it up. Not only was she had self-proclaimed authority, teaching the doctrine of Satan, she was advocating what we immoral living. In verse 21, I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her immorality. And in teaching and seducing my servants to practice immorality and to eat foods sacrificed to idols. What's, we're not exactly sure what she was teaching, 
But scholars believe she was spreading a thinking that they could now, because Thyatira, they want their businesses to succeed. They go to the guilds and let's just participate in this worship. Let's sacrifice, you know, hug, kiss, kiss some grandmas, hug, uh, hold some babies, you know, all of that stuff like that. But they were, they were not only, they were falling into physical immorality and idolatry. These celebrations to the idols and getting the blessings of the patron saints and the disgusting revelry that would happen consistently at these things, the Christians were saying, well, if it's good for business, it's good for business. And they were being lured in by Jezebel, says, of course you can do that. God wants you happy. God wants you wealthy. God wants you to succeed. And they were like, oh, I had no idea. And she was teaching these deep things. But probably there was something greater that was going on, just simply walking them into immorality that was not consistent with one who claims Christ alone. There was a great spiritual immorality that was happening. Just as Jezebel in the Old Testament not only led Ahab, but all of the nation into wickedness in the worship of Baal, this Jezebel was leading these churches, this fire tiring believers, into spiritual adultery that was happening and spiritual immorality. They were leading Christians who were the bride of Christ to flirt with the idols of the world and commit spiritual adultery, to abandon their commitment to Christ in order to embrace the cultural norms, which, brothers and sisters, Scripture says is idolatry. Moreover, as there was church discipline that was attempted here, she was unrepentant. They were trying to reconcile Jezebel and her followers with the church and recalibrate their thinking according to the word of God. Because church discipline is never to bring a rod down on somebody and to be heavy-handed. Church discipline is always like a skilled physician uses the, 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 the um, scalpel, the knife, let's say knife, sorry, uh, medical people, I just ruined that. Use the scalpel, there it is, the scalpel of the word of God to remove the camp cancer, not a hammer that comes down on anybody that disagrees with you and fuels your self-pride. And she was unrepentant because these people treasured their sin over the holiness of God, and they wanted their idolatry more than they wanted to be faithful to the one true God. The love of their idols was greater than their love for Christ. The lips, the sweet honey on the lips of the forbidden idolatrous woman were more attractive to them than living and drinking living water from the wells of their covenant God. Ocean Park, where have we, where have you, where have I listened to the teachings of Jezebel that seduce us from loving and serving the one true God? We have deserted the love and service of Christ often to, to embrace the idolatrous teachings of modern-day Jezebels. Where is our idolatry? Where's your idolatry? Where's mine? Idolatry is something that you're convinced that you have to have, and if you don't have that thing, your life is not worth living. How can I live without that? Let me give you a few examples of idolatry. The ideal relationship with your spouse, with your parents, with your children, physical satisfaction, status, power, beauty, um, pleasure, wealth, respect, or as we see this weekend, a white heritage free from the stain of blacks and Jews. That is idolatry. And they will do whatever they possibly can to be able to fuel that. What do you believe that you must have to have to be able to survive? And what are you willing to sacrifice to get it? Where has Jezebel whispered in your ear, has God really said? What voices are you listening to and why are you listening to them? The objects of your desire reveal the gods of your heart. It may not just be the idolatrous pull that is getting you, but you are buying into these deep things of God, or Satan, excuse me that you have believed that there is a deeper level and a deeper thinking that, that renders your lifestyle irrelevant as long as you think right and you can serve God. I believe in today's day and age, the 
deep things of Jezebel are the word tolerance. J. Michael Ramsey in his commentary said, tolerance in our society is the only real virtue. And intolerance is the only vice. As long as we think a, different, a certain way, we can live any way we want. That is the doctrine of Jezebel. Now, for example, and I'm very careful because I know there's ears in the cornfield. In 1960s, the, several, the, the sexual revolution has rendered a society that is dripping with lust. We're constantly bombarded with images of provocative and, and seductive women on our TVs, in our social media, in our magazines. College campuses are, are, are fueled with immorality and it's expected and it's celebrated. Primetime television shows and commercials are loaded with sensuality. HBO, Netflix, and Hulu are cornucopias that are filled with TV mature shows that have gratuitous scenes that lead little to nothing to the imagination. These shows have choreographers who specialize in, insult, uh, in assault on women. And if you want to know what that real word is, I'll tell you after, it's disgusting that we even have a term for this. There are websites that exist that help you find someone with whom to be unfaithful to your marriage with. You can be with whoever you want, whenever you want, and wherever you want. And sadly, many professing Christians are not just stumbling into these things on a weak moment, because we are weak. But what they're doing is they're embracing these things unabashedly. We think somehow that as long as we think about Jesus that we can live however we want and endorse the world. The idolatrous teachings of Jezebel have had a profound effect on the church. 50 years ago, what a pagan culture thought was unthinkable has now been embraced by churches and denominations. In 50 years, this radical shift has happened. It's fascinating and it's deplorable and it's heartbreaking. The church now turns a blind eye to immorality, overlooks adultery, and embrace, endorses homosexuality. The teaching of Jezebel has convinced the church, the church, that how we live does not matter as long as what we think is tolerant. That is exactly the deep things of Jezebel that she's teaching. It doesn't matter what you do. It's just that you, you know, you're happy with everybody. Ocean Park, it was the sin of tolerance that Jesus came to this church in Thyatira. I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman, Jezebel. We can't simply tolerate false teaching that leads to immorality. It's neither faithful thinking nor faithful living in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. Now, let me allow me a disclaimer here, because when I say stuff like this, it can be misconstrued. One, we love those. And we're, we love our neighbors with false theology, and we point them towards the truth. Never should words and slurs be on our lips. Never we should be hateful and unkind to somebody with false theology in these ways. It is never okay. Remember the accusations that they made against Jesus. He was a friend to sinners and tax collectors. He ate with prostitutes, people with, 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 with immorality. Do you love sinners enough to lovingly point them towards Jesus? We have to have relationships with people in this world, our coworkers, our friends and families. You will face these things. Because on the other side, there's the thinking that could corrupt many. Don't think because you live a moral life that you know Jesus. Because look at Ephesus. They knew doctrine, and they were very good. They were trained by Paul and Timothy and John and Priscilla and Aquila, but they did not have love. And Jesus says, I will take that lampstand from your church unless you repent. Jesus had a passionate contempt against the self-righteous, a.k.a. the Pharisees. He called them a brood of vipers, and he compared them to whitewashed tombs. They thought that what they did and what they didn't do could earn them favor with God. But unbeknownst to them the whole time, they were no different than the sinners and the tax collectors. Brothers and sisters, both the sinners and the self-righteous are desperately lost, and they need Christ. Therefore, we are called to love and to teach 
and to not approve of immorality, but to point ourselves and our sinful hearts and our brothers and sisters and our neighbors towards Christ. Ocean Park, where are you? Where have you gone too far in your thinking and your actions? Where do we as a church and where do we as individuals need to repent of false teaching and false living and return to Christ? Because there is still time. Jesus calls us to repent. And because he calls us to repent, that's the promise that they, we have not gone too far for the reach of grace. And we see the promises of God in verse 22 through 29. Let me ask you this. Have you ever, some of you have like DVRs and you fast forward through commercials, but if you're ever watching a live sporting event and they have a prescription drug are, and all the people are happy and they're, you know, they're just, life is great because they're on this medication. And then announcer voice comes on and tells you all of these side effects. Well, there's one that's called Shantax and it's a drug to help you quit smoking. And it says, helps you quit the urge of, to, uh, or, I'm sorry. It helps with the urge to quit smoking. You're like, great. Smoking's not good for me. It's expensive. Let's go ahead and, and do this. And th then it says this. Some people have had serious side effects while taking Shantex to help them quit smoking, including new or worse mental health problems, changes in behavior, thinking, aggression, hostility, agitation, depressed mood, or suicidal thoughts and action. Just keep smoking. That's terrible. Just go ahead. Oftentimes, the things that we turn to for relief are worse than the original problems. And ultimately, what Jezebel was doing is she was preying on this attitude that these people were minorities in this culture, and they were trying to be faithful to Jesus and trying to provide for their families. And they thought the only way they could do that is go to these guilds and, and go with the motions and, and, and let things happen the way they did. And so when Jezebel said, no, silly rabbit, no, you can, as long as you love Jesus, you can do whatever you want. Whoa, well, that changes everything, doesn't it? But Jesus then, when the word of Jesus came, said, not so fast, my friend. Notice in, he gives two promises to the unrepentant, to these followers of Jezebel in verse 22. Behold, I will throw her into a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her, I will throw them into great tribulation unless they repent of their works. To oppose God and his doctrines is neither safe nor is it wise. The Lord will not allow false teaching to go unchallenged. Those in the church who are being seduced by these things of Jezebel can often expect to be faced the opposition of God in the form of physical sickness. The Lord will not sit idly by while his people commit spiritual adultery. Often when I fence the table, but, uh, I'm not getting it. There we go. Often when I, we have communion, I tell people, and I will later, about the importance and the reverence of communion. This is not something that we take lightly and flippantly because of this verse in 1 Corinthians. The very same thing it says, For no one who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgments on himself or herself. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. There are physical results from spiritual sin, physical results from spiritual sin. And it says this right here, God is willing to touch your body physically to save your soul. That is the grace of God. We see that in 1 Corinthians 5 where Paul says, we will hand them over to Satan to save his soul. And what he promises is that he will transform Jezebel's bed of adultery into a sick bed in order to lead these people to repentance. And then we see in verse 23, not only will there be physical sickness, but a spiritual death. Verse 23, I will strike her children dead. Sadly, there will be those who do not heed the warnings of Scripture. They will not heed the words of Jesus, and they will continue in their perversion and their idolatry. And just as the ten spies of Israel, who did not believe the promises of God and said, no way can we go into the promised land, the plague struck them and they died. Only Joshua and Caleb, 
who were faithful and put their, prom- their faith in the trust of God and the promises of God. Brothers and sisters, God will not be mocked. We see this as revelation will finally unfold. In verse 23, when this happens, the churches, all the churches will know that I am the one who searches heart and mind, and I will give to each of you according to your works. The way we live reflects the faith and the thinking of our hearts. When the eternal kingdom of Christ is established and he divides the faithful from the unfaithful, from the apostle, or for the imposters, from disciples, from enemies and friends, from sheep and the goats, he will not be deceived by superficial words. Didn't we do things in your name? And what does he say? I be gone, I never knew you. Because the eyes of Jesus penetrate to the heart and his feet are on the authority of his righteousness. Christ is the one who searches minds and hearts and he will reward the faithful and condemn the faithless. But it's not just with this negative promise of cursing, but there is the promise of the blessing. Notice verse 24, but to the rest of you in Thyatira, to these faithful ones, who do not hold to this teaching and have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. To you I say, do not lay hold of any other burden. Only hold fast what you have till I come. Jesus said, it is the Father's good will to give you the kingdom, little flock. We struggle in this kingdom that we're in now trying to provide for our needs and be faithful to this coming glorious mighty king. Jesus promises there will be a place of honor in his kingdom. Notice in verse 26 and 27, to the one who conquers, as some translations say overcome, this is a battle word, the struggle between kingdoms, who keeps my word until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father. Does that take you back to Psalm 2, the call to worship? Because Jesus is the one who has the authority. And what is this promise? We're going to have a place in his kingdom. Jesus shall reign where'er the sun doth its progressive journey run. And as Christians in this new heaven and new earth, we will be, have dominion and be a part of this kingdom just as Adam and Eve had dominion in the garden and they reigned with Christ. He was the authority in the new heavens and new earth. People will fill the new heavens and new earth and have dominion and be a part of his reign and a part of his kingdom in majesty, power, and honor. And it won't be like it is today when... Christians are ostracized and criminalized. They're marginalized and they're trivialized. They will have a place in his kingdom. And notice verse 28, the second promise he gives to the faithful. And I will give him the morning star. In the ancient world, as these readers were hearing this, the ancient star was associated with the planet Venus, this bright star in the sky, or the planet, but they thought it was a star. And and they said, actually, the Caesars and the emperors were descendants from this star. And Jesus says, no, I am the bright and morning star. And what does it say to the faithful who adhere to his word and wait for his kingdom? They will have a glorious king who will know them by name. And he will satisfy them with the bread from heaven and the waters of living, the waters of life. There's a promise that he gives his people. At the end of Psalm chapter two, Psalm 2, at the end of this great messianic um, prop, uh, psalm, blessed are all who take refuge in his hand. Brothers and sisters, we have a king who is coming. We can be faithful. Though this world with devils filled would threaten to undo us, as Luther said, there is a king. He knows our name. He holds us in his hand no matter how the foundations of what we think we should be able to trust shake. There is a kingdom, Hebrews says, that will not shake in his name. And the king of that kingdom is Jesus Christ. You are safe in the shadow of the cross. And he will come and he will bring us into this banquet feast that initiates this great kingdom. And we will reign with him and he will know us and we will have fellowship and we will walk with him as Adam and Eve walked with him in the garden. 
Ocean Park, will you be ready for this eternal king as he returns? Or is your focus on how much you can get away with in this world? Where's your idolatry? Who do you serve? The kingdoms of Satan, it's revealed, or the kingdom of Jesus Christ that is coming. And that this time that we struggle and we had time will be like when we were little boys and girls in recess, how quickly it went by. We won't remember it. We will have eternity with our king who is good and faithful and wise and just. Repent of your sin before it's too late for the first time and another time. Each day we must repent. The first time we repented was the first time we heard the, new, the good news of the gospel and we said, I am going to turn from these idols, the world behind me, the cross before me, and I will follow Jesus. Brothers and sisters, those of you who know Christ and know yourself, we know that we must repent every day. Those who belong to Jesus repent, and those who do not, belong, do not repent do not belong to Jesus. Those who refuse to re repent of their identity with Jezebel do not belong, have an identity with Christ. And those who refuse to repent identify themselves as Jezebel's children. And those who repent and believe in the promises of God show themselves to be the children of the great king. How far is too far? We cannot pledge allegiance to this world and to the coming kin. Jesus says, repent of your sin and turn to me. Jesus, gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you. And as this morning, as we turn our attention to the table, we remember the great cost of the kingdom for our place in this kingdom, for we are sinful people who have traded the truth of God for a lie. But as the children we read this morning, Jesus, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit whisper, I love you. And they have begun this plan of redemption that was promised to Abraham that through you all the nations of the world will be blessed. Through Judah who says your descendants will hold a, a scepter in your hand and you will reign. To David, the king, the descendant who will sit on my throne. To the prophets, the branch of Jesse that will rise. To Malachi, the Lord will come to his temple. And as the prophet Anna and Simeon declared when Jesus came, we may die for our eyes have seen the king. And Father, as we turn to the table, we remember that king was not a king that was, uh, had a crown on his head with purple flowing robes and he was, he was adored by the nations. This is a king who had a crown of thorns, who hung naked on a cross, bloody, beaten, smitten, and afflicted to redeem us from the kingdom of Satan. This king rose from the dead. He is clothed in glorious white and he is at the right hand of the Father and he makes intercession and uh, advocates on our behalf. And that king is returning in glory and might to put away and vanquish sin and to call his people. And Father, as we wait and remember, we say, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Father, we turn to the table as repentant sinners, not treasuring our sin, but saying though we are sinners and we are flawed and we are sinful, we know the answer is not working harder and being nice and being moral, but the answer is turning to Christ and repenting of our sins. We do that each time we come to the table. We do that each day. Father, thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.